Have you ever caught yourself on YouTube at 3 a.m. watching a BBC clip of lions hunting down a gazelle, just thinking to yourself, man, how the hell do they even film these? Nah? Just me? Well, okay. Well, whether you're a science nerd like me or someone who simply loves nature, you're in for a treat. Gab Mejia is a National Geographic photographer and conservationist that has traveled everywhere from the icy mountain caps of Patagonia to the mystical island of Mindoro in search of the perfect shot. In this episode, we go over his emergence as a photographer from being an engineering student, his experiences working with diverse landscapes and species, and even break down some of his most iconic shots. I hope you all enjoy this one and special thanks to Mystique for sponsoring this episode. So now, let's hop on right into the pod with Gab Mejia. That was a hoot! What is poppin' and welcome to the Rocka's Modern Life Show. My name is Rocka, future veterinarian, ex-varsity athlete, and dude who loves to talk about all things hot in PH pop culture. Despite the name, the show ain't about me, but truly about the unique things that my guests bring to the table while also providing some quality kalkohan. So buckle up and let's get rockin'. What is one item that is essential for everyday usage in 2021? Sunglasses? Nah, we indoors most of the time. Backpack? To carry your stuff to what? The kitchen? I don't think so. But hand sanitizer? Matikian. Whether you're working from home or traveling daily, you always have to make sure that you are protected from all of the germs that infest our surroundings. That's why I partnered up with Mystique, a local shop that sells hand sanitizer made from 100% natural ingredients infused with essential oils. Mystique's hand sanitizer, or hand mist as the name suggests, removed all of the unnecessary and harmful ingredients that you find in your big corp alcohol brands and replaced them with organic and relaxing components. With their mission being to reinvent the concept of natural and environmentally friendly solutions one product at a time, I knew I had to pair up with this local business. They currently offer two scents to choose from, olive and my personal favorite, green tea. Order now from Mystique by checking out their Instagram page at underscore M-I-S-T-Q or by emailing winkydelacruz at gmail.com. Again, that's at underscore M-I-S-T-Q on Instagram or winkydelacruz at gmail.com for email. Order now from Mystique. What's up, Gab? Why don't you introduce yourself, your profession, and your favorite Philippine mountain? So, hey, Rocket. So, my name is Gab. Um, I'm a freelance conservation photographer. Uh, I'm a National Geographic explorer and a, a writer, an environmental writer for the Manila, Man, the Manila Times. So, I basically do storytelling work, sharing stories about indigenous communities, wildlife, nature, uh, the climate crisis, and empowering you know indigenous mi- minorities as well in how we can live in a better and balanced world and planet. So. My profession is really, I know I have mixed professions, but I've always aligned it into, you know, storytelling, like telling stories about the beauty and fragility of nature. So as a photographer, I wanted to show also the visual, the visual language and visual expression of how uh, we could see animals, we could see the issues in the planet in better light and, you know, more concrete examples and, and storytelling. I also do a bit of documentary filmmaking work. So more of like um, those blue chip BBC films, helping in script writing, uh, writing um, a little bit of editing. And it's really all around, I guess, like writing, visual storytelling, photography, filmmaking. Uh, I guess that would be my career or like my profession, if I would say. Because, you know, I'm also studying up um, civil engineering and some people ask me, oh, shit, why are you studying like, you know, engineering and then yeah, like photography or like storytelling. It's like right, two complete right. different worlds. And I took up um, civil, I'm taking up civil engineering. It's actually my last semester Ooh, and congrats. I'm specializing in environmental engineering. So I was actually able to integrate my love for the arts, for storytelling with um, the sciences of how you can actually create solutions in solving these issues that we've been documenting and we've been researching for quite a while. And you know, I think my favorite Philippine mountain, 
I love every Philippine mountain, no doubt. But like, if there is one Philippine mountain, I guess that really represents, I guess, or the country or the Philippines would be Mount Apo. So have mm-hmm. you been? Mount Apo is really I mean, the I, tallest I know, mountain in the yeah. Philippines. I know what yeah, Mount Apo right? is, but I've I've never been. So like, what about it speaks most to you? I guess. I think it's because it's even its name, like Mount Apo, it's like the grandfather of all mountains in the Philippines, mm. and it's it really has a lot of tales, community, communities, indigenous communities living in them, and especially like one of my favorite animals, which is the Philippine eagle, uh, nests in the the mountains of uh, Mount Apo, right. and it's such a you know a representative thing of how this tall mountain caters a lot of biodiversity, a lot of wildlife, and a lot of stories, cultural stories intertwined in one place. They're really, you know, like seeing you're on top of the Philippines. Basically, you're in the, the tallest point in our country and seeing everything below you, all the life that you've known, all the stories, all the, the creatures, your family and friends, all there down under and like living a different life. And you're, you're there above the clouds. I think it's a pretty different ecstatic feeling that's really, you know, st- stuck to me in my uh, memories. Yeah, for sure. And it sounds like an absolutely crazy experience. How how long does it take to, um, for both ways, both um, mm-hmm. ascending and descending? So the, the, there are different trails in Mount Apo. So it really depends on if you want to be the more hardcore person, you could take like the whole Talomo, Mount Talomo Traverse. So that's what we did, which what was like around five, five, six days. So around three days going up, two days going down. But there are easier hikes um, mm-hmm. here, easier trails like the Catalungan Te Akal. Sorry, I forgot the uh, the name yeah. of the trail. <laughs> no worries. But um, but it's about three days. Yeah, like okay. two days going up, then one day going down. So oh, it's pretty so- relatively established trail. So mm-hmm. you know. The hardship, there's it's still de- it's definitely hard because it's the yeah. tallest mountain. It's like a nine out of nine in you know the guidebooks of Philippine mountains. Yeah. But right, yeah. Um, at least there's like you know two trails, you know, for like the intermediate, I'd say the least, and then you know a little mm-hmm. bit more of advanced. But must have been so crazy hiking up that mountain, just knowing that you're so immersed in the different biodiversity in the Philippines. And I know that a lot of our endemic uh, species are usually found in Mindanao area. I mean, other than mm-hmm. the Tamarau, um, yeah. a lot of our <laughs> unique species are there, right? Like Bukidnon area, yeah. Mindanao, and it must have been so amazing to hike up that mountain. And hopefully I get to one day. Yeah, um, I wish, you know, more people could actually see Mindanao because, you know, we, we've always been, I think there was this stigma like growing up from Manila or like how Mindanao is always painted in war or conflict yeah. and really not about its beautiful treasures like what you've said the the amazing species and wildlife and it's something that like adds to our own identity as filipinos and understanding that kind of um treasures that we have and what we hold to lose yeah no and i'm I'm sure that um uh, you've got to experience uh, numerous types of mountains in the philippines and see it firsthand and i find it just so great that you found a medium to somehow show the people that don't have um, the luxuries of getting to travel to these places, kind of giving them a glimpse of what it's like to be there. And not only that, but by telling them stories as well about the people there, the animals. And it's just really great work. And before we start, I just want to say, I'm a huge fan of your work, man. Like, (laughs) literally, you have one of the most beautiful landscape and wildlife shots I've seen and it's crazy that you got one of your photos on those yellow borders, man. Like, that's literally, like, one of my dreams. Well, not necessarily for photography, but just to be featured in, like, National Geographic. Because I grew up watching Nat Geo, Discovery, Animal Planet. And I'm sure you did, too. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> right, right? So, it's just yeah. so impressive. And, uh, like I said, like, not only do you um, take great photos, like, amazing photos, but you're also a, a great speaker, and it's really inspiring for myself and for the next generation. So thank you for allotting time for me and my listeners. Oh, thanks, man. I really appreciate it. You know, it, I guess it just comes with the journey yeah, of learning. For sure. For sure. All right. So um, why don't we get on to our first question and how I like to start each pod by asking my guests, what's poppin'? 
what's poppin'? So Gab, what's poppin', man? <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 here in La Union right now. Um, been surfing a lot. Um, been eating a lot of food, and just going around the beach and really chilling. You mm -hmm. know, it's been like nine, ten months after the the start of the lockdown. And you just needed to really breathe fresh air because, you know, the life we've known or we've used to know where we were more outside, outdoors. And just being by the beach actually helps cope, uh, helps me in coping, especially with the pandemic, you know. It's been really a hard, difficult, difficult um, time we're all living in. Of course, man. And I can only imagine for you, the wanderer that you are within the first couple of months stuck in lockdown where you can't even leave your house must have been insane for you. What was that like going like yeah, the first it, three months? <laughs> <laughs> the first three months, I, I was very in a denial mode. Like I that this pandemic would end in like the next two weeks. What a joke. You know, but yeah. after that, it's like the whole month, month after month after month. And it's really been, you know, really hard because like, um, I was very used to traveling, always out in the go. I was supposed to be only in the Philippines for about, you know, one month in total with all the expeditions really? and productions that we had in 2020. And everything got canceled. Everything got postponed. And like all the opportunities, um, all the, the, the windows for uh, immersing in nature and even developing my career as a storyteller, learning with different photographers or creating films, everything was just like a bitch slap in my face, like how, you know, you got to settle down. And, and it was definitely hard coping. Like the first three months, yeah, it's really, I had to find different ways to cope, like go back, going back to my old habits, playing yeah. computer, reading, <laughs> just finding ways to, you know, feel better about the state of the world and like how, how it is, how, how it really affected each one of us. No, for sure. And we all had to find our own, um, sort of self-coping mechanism and um, it's a lot of self-reflection for at least those first three months and uh, I'm sure like you feel most yourself when you're immersed in nature when you're out there so it was must have been pretty difficult for you as that type of individual to be stuck inside so is this La, La Union um, trip of yours the first time that you're leaving the city or no naman? Um, no, it's the first time that I'm living out of, like, out of the city, like, living in the city or, like, traveling, like, the first like time I've traveled. Yeah, like, first time you traveled outside of, um, after the quarantine, I guess, the ECQ. Well, um, not really. I had a, a project in October last year, 2020, with the Tamar House. So, that oh. was a, a good breather as well. But, I mean, it was a heartbreaking breather because I had to see, like, the last captive Tamar yeah. dead in my eyes and, you know. Oh, so you, the you were there during the necropsy of um of yeah Kali. of Cali oh Cali Basi, and like seeing the rangers, the the sorrow, the gr the grieving rangers, Tamara rangers. It was really hard. They were they were crying in the interviews, um, and just you know you see that there was a bond, and you know, and it felt really really overwhelming. Like seeing how, like living throughout the pandemic, like living the first six months and going to another October. On October with this heartbreaking story it was a really tough uh, tough time to bear it was actually kind of traumatizing that I had to sit down again and rethink rethink of what I what I've been doing of course man and it's just so rough that just a couple of months after Kali passes away Pagasa also passes oh, away yeah. all, all the the icons of her you know I our know, Philippine know. endemic and endangered animals are you know dying out slowly yep. and it's all happening during the pandemic, which yeah, makes it honestly worse. All within the same year. But I mean, I guess there are some positives that you could take out of this, you know, yeah. um, the exposure at least that um, these animals are dying and are, are special and unique endemic species are like, like, fa it's like fastly declining. So it's a good wake up call, especially since I feel like the pandemic made us all more woke. So like all of, uh, <laughs> all of us in our generation, like we're all like, yeah. you know, trying to find our advocacy, which is fantastic. I, I think that's one of the few good things that came out of this quarantine. And, uh, you know, what are yeah. my, what are my like, goals for this year is actually to see the Tamaraos because I've never, and they've always been like an iconic species for me and I've always wanted to visit them. So maybe after the show, I'll ask you a bit of how you got the, um, yeah, the, you should. the trip done. Yeah. yeah. Dude. 
Since starting photography as a hobby in the early 2010s, Gab has propelled himself into becoming a Nat Geo photographer and, more recently, a member of the Forbes magazine's 30 Under 30 list. Though what sets Gab apart from other photographers are the stories he narrates about his subjects, frequently advocating for our endangered species and sharing stories of pristine lands and indigenous communities. I find it crazy to believe how rapidly his hobby turned into a career in just a matter of years. Gab could have easily stuck with his original path as an engineering student and lived a quote-unquote normal college student life. But what interests me is what changed for him throughout his journey which ultimately led him to break out as a photographer. To understand more about how Gab got into the position he's in today, I decided to ask him the origin story of his career as a young environmental photographer. Um, I think it really began with my love for nature. I guess mountaineering was my fuel for photography, if I would say. And photography became my passport to the world. So it really, it was really me hiking at a young age. I started hiking when I was uh, 13, 12. My dad would bring me to Mount Makiling, Mount Samat, all these different local mountains. And then one day he brought me to like this big expedition to the tallest mountain in Malaysia. And I was 13 at the time. It was 2010. That's Kinabalu, right? Like, yeah, Mount Kinabalu. Yeah. So Kota Kinabalu, it's like 4,000 meters above sea level, almost wow. twice the height of Mount Apo. And it was really like my first time to hike this big mountain. And it was overwhelming. I, I actually didn't get to finish that mountain. Really? Um, I failed. I failed to go to the summit. I only reached around like 3,000 meters above sea level. It was raining all the time. There was like a whole storm. It was raining the whole time. But, you know, after being there, I told myself like, okay, hey, when I turn 18, when I'm legally able to travel alone, I would find a way to do so. I would want to see more of this raw, untouched, pristine beauty of nature, of these mountains, of like going and climbing. Like it never, I never felt more alive in that moment when I was 13. I said, okay, I dedicated my life. I, I dedicated the career that I had working different part-time uh, jobs to, to earn for my first camera and it was then when I said okay I wanted to like take in these moments that I've had in these mountains of hiking these mountains and I wanted to share them so photography basically became my medium to be able to share these personal stories at the first like of sharing my hikes my adventures my travels and then I never realized how like photography can actually you know change um change the way you look at life and how you live life being able to see different things through a lens and how you can share these 2d images these flat images and all these images are just comprised of the world that you see and i joined def different photo competitions i think with the the hikes that i've been doing so it was more of a hobby at the start before it actually became really you know a career it uh, I, I was lucky enough to to win this like global youth wetlands photo competition in 2017, which was f featured in National Geographic, and the prize was basically to that they would send me anywhere around the world with wetlands because the story was about wetlands and they gave me a list of all the countries I could go to, all expense paid trip to you know, it, I could have chosen Madagascar, Antarctica. Greenland mm -hmm. and right. all these countries and I chose the farthest most part of the planet which is from the Philippines which is uh, this place called Patagonia <laughs> nice so Oof, it's found in Argentina and Chile and it I mean looking back now it's been really really fast so that happened in 2017 and I was alone there for six weeks trying to create a story about the the receding glaciers how fast the glaciers are melting how the wetlands are degrading because of the climate crisis and i guess after that uh, the opportunities just came in and came in like um i had a, a mentor that told me to to apply for this national geographic early career grant uh, for the storytelling grant and that was in 2018 late of 2018 and i applied for it i wanted to do a story about my own country because it was it i kind of felt off for me to be traveling so far away to patagonia to tell a story of of an alien world right? and how I haven't even been telling I've only been telling stories about the mountains about uh, um, 
the the hikes that I've the personal travels that I've had, and I realized how it it could have been a little bit more selfish of me to just to just dwell on that idea that photography is just about sharing my own life. But what about the what other lives like? Yeah, so I chose like the Agusan marshlands as really my pinpoint because it also resonated to my advocacy of wetlands, and that's when I. I guess it really took off like getting I never really imagined of getting it in an early age, you know, like um, being a being featured in National Geographic or having my stories out there. It, it's, it's really been a whirlwind of experiences. And I would say I, I was very, very lucky to have had that opportunity when I was 13 to climb a mountain. And ever since that day, I, I have never really looked back to Man, that's that's so crazy. And who knew that that one failure in uh, Mount Kinabalu would have propelled, like, served as a catalyst for yourself and taking you literally to all places all over the world. And it's like, yeah, just good to keep in mind that you know these failures can always serve as a stepping stone f- for reaching who you want to be. And you literally got to go to Patagonia, and of course you chose Patagonia because like it's a free trip. You know, gotta make yeah, it like, good, though. Yeah, the most, the farthest, uh, <laughs> the costliest air ticket. You know. Yeah, <laughs> of course, of course. I, <laughs> I had like five flights just to to get from Manila all the way to the five southernmost flights. city. Yeah, in That's Ushuaia. Crazy. It's it's really crazy. Like, what's the route to get there? I, I actually have like, no clue. I flew from Manila all the way to Istanbul, Turkey. Yeah, in Istanbul, all the way to to um, Sao Paulo in Brazil. Oh wow, then, that's a long flight. <laughs> yeah, and then Sao Paulo. Yeah, that was like the longest flight I had. It was like eighteen hours. Oh my then god. Then <laughs> Sao Paulo, all the way to um, Buenos Aires. Uh, there was like a layover in Buenos Aires. Then Buenos Aires to the small city town in the middle of Argentina because it's the long stretch, right? South America. Yeah. yeah. It's a long stretch. So in the middle, it's called Trelu. Then from Trelu to the southernmost city in Ushuaia. So it's really called, it's actually the Cape Horn, or they call it the, the Tierra del Fuego or Land of Fire. So it's like bordering Antarctica already in that, wow. in that, in that place. That's nuts, man. That's like at least three full days of traveling nonstop. Yeah. <laughs> but- it's good that I was going back, you know, like going back in time, like the yeah. time zone. So I, I saved like two days at least. Or oh, not, wow. Okay. Yeah. At but going that. back from that place to Manila, I lost like three days of my life oh my <laughs> in God. an airplane. <laughs> Just in an airplane. And you were alone this entire trip? Yeah, I was alone for... Uh, I went there like... I was actually just finishing the semester and, and that time in 2017. Mm-hmm. So the moment there was the Christmas break, right? We have a semestral break. I took off. Then <laughs> for the whole what, six weeks, I was out until February, the first... A uh, week of February, so December, second week of December until February. That's nuts, man. What was it like? I guess traveling the entire world by yourself. Not like I don't know if you know how to speak Spanish, but like you know, not n- being exactly fluent in their language, and you know, going to cities that even people in the same country haven't been to. So, what was that like? You know, as in terms of your like character development and just like you know, personal stories. Yeah, I think it really helped me grow as a person, you know, being able to travel alone, no one to take care of you, no one to um, give you medicine. You have to cook for yourself. You have to eat, eat eat by yourself. You have to pitch your tent by yourself. You have to do all these things for all, all around the world. And it really helped me internalize a lot of, uh, I guess, the sense of level of consciousness that I've had as a person because uh, before I think before that trip, if I would revisit it, I was really more of like the oh free free lucky free going spirit adventure like free spirit adventure right uh, just traveling 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 and really I realized how how much okay it could be inspiring for others but I mean the impact that I was doing it wasn't really as fulfilling as I would seem it was like I I had to develop a way in how this would not be in vain, basically. Like all these places that the opportunities that I've had to be able to travel across the world do not be in vain, you know? Like it, there's always more to just like living your fullest. And I think that sense of fulfillment was what I really got in traveling alone. It made me realize that I want more than being just a traveler, I wanted to be more of a photographer. 
that I was more of a photographer than I was uh, a mountaineer or a traveler. And right. I wanted to tell stories and I realized how, and that made me really rethink of my career, of what I wanted to do in my life. Because, you know, there, there was really a lot of sacrifices in, in traveling alone. Like, you, yeah, you, you, you sure. lose a lot and a lot of time from your family, from your friends, from anything, basically anything that gives you comfort in life. And it was really such a, I guess, <laughs> cliche as it sounds, like a really a life-changing adventure or, you know, that, that kind of soul, what people do in soul searching, right? They, they, yeah. they book a train or they book a flight to a one-way <laughs> one ticket, ticket somewhere. Yeah. yeah. And, then, that, and it changes your life. And yeah, as cliche as it sounded, it did. And it made me realize what I wanted to do more in the future. And I guess that was really the greatest lesson I, I've had in traveling alone. Damn, that's crazy. And I don't think you could say that it's cliche because, dude, you literally traveled across the world with, you know, not knowing, understanding the language completely alone. So I'm sure that you've gained like more than enough life experiences from that one trip um, than that you could have ever achieved from just staying here, you know, being in Manila. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I even had to look, like take a leave of absence one time because um, of different projects. And you know, I realized that there's so much more to learn, really, outside school. And like when people say that a successful life, a way to life is like graduating as a doctor, an engineer, or, um, you know, a lawyer or any profession that you want, I realized it was really more out of the life. But it also comes from a place of privilege to say this, you know. Of course. Like, there's always this thinking that, you know, being able to pursue the arts in the Philippines or pursue storytelling and traveling in the Philippines is a privilege. No, for sure. And um, we're lucky enough to be at least even thinking of uh, pursuing these goals when other people are, you know, focused on putting food on their plate and having lights in their houses. Yeah, and, that's true. you know, it just puts things, things into perspective for you. And, you know, um, you've grown a lot as a photographer since um, you won that shot um of the goose and marsh in back in 2017 would you say that was your bucket shot that really got the the ball rolling for you as a photographer the, the photo wasn't taken in the goose and marsh it was taken in um the gabaldon floodplains in Ooh, okay. i'm gonna and... show the picture because i actually have it prepared so for the viewers that are watching this video on youtube this is the shot yeah right? that, that one right? yeah yeah I guess if, if I don't know if it's the bucket shot, you know, because I was still, I guess, a learning photographer, a really amateur photographer that then, you know, taking landscapes, mm -hmm. and and I, I took I didn't take this with a drone. I actually hiked the mountain in Nueva Ecija. I was with oh, wow. Pinoy, the Pinoy Mountaineer group, and we were doing exploratory climbs. And when we we saw this spot, it was just really breathtaking. It was like a resemblance of South America, honestly, the con the shape yeah. of the wetlands of how it's shaped. It's like the continent of South America and it led me there. But I think the bucket shot that I always say, you know, is always the shot that I'm going to take next. I don't know Ooh, if it's too cheesy nice. or no, no, yeah, no. No, it's, 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 it's always going to be the shot that I'm going to take next because it's always going to be coming from a learned experience in the, the projects that I, that I've done, right? Like the bucket shot, your bucket shot should always be the future photograph that you're going to be taking because it has to be, better or you know at least better than it was or better than all the photos you've taken yeah just always trying to find ways to improve yourself and i, th I feel like with that mindset you know it's only upward from here and i noticed in a lot of your photos as i was going through your feed a while ago that a lot of them are mountain shots and as you mentioned earlier you love to hike mountains so what is it about the mountains that like draws you in like what about it is it the views the air the like remoteness of everything it's, it's really everything that comes with mountaineering i guess i think it's if there's like one thing that really depicts or symbolizes life as it is it, it's really hiking a mountain i've always had said this quote that the greatest mountain we can climb is this mountain we call life and it's really all different how there's so many slopes, steep slopes. It's all an uphill and downhill battle. And you're uncertain about it. All the the weather, the if it's going to rain, the view, you really have no control of it. 
and it's just you choosing to climb it, you choosing to to continue or to go back down. But as long as you've done it, or as long as you chose to actually climb the mountain, you you've really experienced it and lived at it at all. I actually have a favorite quote that best um, explains it. It's by Rene Domal. He's okay. a French like spiritual. Um, she's like a writer, a, a French spiritual writer, philosophical okay. writer, and one of his quotes was saying like, um, "You cannot stay on the summit forever. You have you have to come down again." So why bother in the first place? Just this. What is above knows what is below, but what is below does not know what is above. One climbs, one sees, one descends, one sees no longer, but one has seen. There is an art of conduct conducting oneself in the lower regions by the memory of what we once saw higher up. When one can no longer see, one can at least still know. Wow. That's deep. Damn, dude, that gave me goosebumps, bro. Like that that's like <laughs> that's super powerful in so many yeah. levels. Whether it's like like wildlife or um ecology related and also as a, as your personal journey, going through whatever you may be going, um trying to strive for. And it's a great way to look at it in relation to the mountains. And yeah, dude, that's a good quote. I, I'm gonna have to ask you for the details. Of that <laughs> yeah. After. yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> my, it's my basically my favorite, my favorite quote. Like, damn, <laughs> that's crazy, man. And you know, you a lot of your photos are about mountains, but you also have photos of wildlife. So I wanted to ask, like. Was wildlife a thing that you were always interested in or did it grow as you started immersing yourself in nature and taking more photos of nature? Yeah, I really was into wildlife ever since when I was a kid, you know, like was as you've said also, like we grew up watching National Geographic, Animal Planet, Discovery. And my, da my dad would always give me like the National um, Geographic magazines. And for me, like wildlife was just about the elephants, the, the big cats of Africa, mm -hmm. right? And, Same. and I, I never realized how actually biodiverse the Philippines was until I got into maybe high school. I only knew about like the, the islands of, wow, we have the most amazing beaches, yeah. but we never realized how much amazing our wildlife is. And that's what I really invested in, like going into wildlife photography, you know, cause, and it's, it's really a hindrance to, to take up wildlife photography because first financial constraints, mm -hmm. um, it's really expensive. The tools to be able to capture yeah, wildlife. Like huge lenses, Huge right? lenses, right? Yeah, yeah, the telephoto lens that would cost you, you know, half a million pesos. I mean, who, who has that when you're yeah. 18 or 17? Right. You know, it's really a form of privilege. Uh, it's also like a place of privilege to be able to take up wildlife photography in of the course. Philippines. But it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. And, and that's really how I really got into, I guess, uh, develop that love for wildlife photography. So how did you make do um, without those like half a million peso lenses? I'm sure like cause wildlife photography is actually something I've always wanted to do. So I'm studying to be a vet, but I also want to do like some wildlife photography in the side, you know, like learn more about the birds and our other endemic species. But, you know, like I don't have half a million pesos lying around. So like, how did you make do with the tools that you have? And I guess when you know that there's... Um, an animal in the area what do you look out for and how do you get these super crisp shots that are on your feed yeah um i guess the the wildlife photography really came in it was really like you know the stars aligned as they say um like uh it started out in nikon because i work with nikon also as a as an ambassador and that allowed me to borrow and get lenses from them which i which are super expensive if I wasn't working with Nikon. And that really, you know, physically allowed me to be able to take wildlife uh, photos and, you know, just go to the places that I've been to, go to the mountains that I've been going into and seeing all these different birds, seeing all these different um, animals that we have from the Tarshir to the Philippine eagle to, to other migratory birds that we have in the in our different wetlands, our tamarau. Um, that's when I... That's when I really got into wildlife photography. It's actually been just recent when I just got into wildlife photography, just about like before 2019 or in 2019. 
So, but you know, the pandemic, we were we were actually doing a, a big um, film um, in March, in March, February, 2020, uh, for like this um, blue chip. They call it blue chip films, which are like the the our planet type right. of BBC films with Nat G Wild. That's we awesome. Were, man. We were supposed to do. We were doing that already, and then suddenly, bam, lockdowns. So. <laughs> I haven't had a chance to really take um, wildlife photography, but I'm actually happy to take you know photos of sea turtles here, right? <laughs> the baby yeah. guns. I've so I, at photos. least I still get to practice it some. You know, it's really about I'm just making use of where I am right now. That's great, man. And you know, we talk about your photos of the mountains and the animals, but you viewers haven't seen it yet. So right after the break, we'll be doing this segment called "Explain That Gram." So if you know um, the show Hot Ones, it's kind of the same concept. Um, but mm. first, we'll take a quick break. Pstui, you, yeah, you, the one there making your morning coffee or getting your daily exercise in. Don't you think that it's time for that new French press or a new set of workout clothes? Don't you feel like you deserve something fresh, something exciting? Because I sure do. So why don't you hop onto Shopee to avail of the non-stop sales that have been going on for as long as one Ponce and Rile has been alive, which is a really long time. Everything from coffee paraphernalia to home workout equipment. We've got it all for you. And the best part is, I was lucky enough to partner up with Shopee to keep you updated with all of the hottest sales. But wait, 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 wait. Before you skip this ad, let me be real with y'all. As you know, I'm a broke full-time vet student and I do this podcast to keep you, my friends and family, informed about the hot topics here in the PH and the industry leaders involved with them. The main reason I started this podcast was to educate and entertain people, and I hope you're learning something new in this episode. So if you enjoy this podcast, it would mean the world to me if you used my Shopee link to keep these episodes coming. All you have to do is to check the description down below or the tap link in my bio to access my personal link. If you're anyone like me, you've probably got tons of items in your cart. So go to Shopee, treat yourself with something new, and support this podcast. Like the beautiful and unwithering Chris Aquino once said, Shop na! And we're back. So as I said before the break, we'll be doing this quick segment called Explain That Gram, wherein I take a deep dive into Gab's Instagram account and you know try to get a little bit more context on the different photos he's taken over the years. And for those listeners who are tuning in via Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Anchor, stop this podcast right now and get on our YouTube page so that you can see the amazing shots that Gab took. And I work hard on these videos, so come on, guys. <laughs> a little help here uh, but yeah just also so that you can see the amazing photos so why don't we get started so the first photo I'm going to show today was your very fo first photo that you posted on Instagram and it was in Pico de Loro in um, this kind of ro tall rock formation on top of a mountain so like why don't you give a little bit more context on what this photo meant for you and you know anything else you'd like to share yeah wow that was 2014 whoa it's like yeah. seven years ago i can't believe it but yeah i think it was this first photo was really i guess the first few solo hikes we've done we've been doing uh and this was really one of the the moments when i would cut classes cut school university <laughs> to just hike you know like the, the, the irresponsible person to just do what you want to do what you want to do in college and and i think the pirate's beak was really i i think it's close now honestly it, it, it has been destroyed after that whole era where a lot of hikers started hiking again and um irresponsible hikers that really trashed the whole place vandalized the rocks oh, and it's sad though but but yeah i think th th these ones are really the early early days of mountaineering that i really still had that dream of Shit, I want to climb at Mount Everest. And, you know, it's just that. <laughs> I guess that was that was really the beginning, the takeoff, this takeoff point, in knowing what I wanted to do. Like, it was in 2010, yeah, when I climbed Kinabalu. But I think in high school, the first four years of high school, I only climbed Mount Pulag in 2013 or 2012. And I, because you know, because our generation that during that time, nobody wanted to hike in high school. 
And it was like, okay, hey, hey, dude, you guys want to hike? Nobody <laughs> wants to hike. They just want yeah. soirees or, yeah, or they just drink. want, you know, go to, go to the malls or drink, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't really a thing before. So in college, that's when I really immersed, joined organizations that allowed me to travel. So I joined like also a diving organization. I, I did apply for UP Mountaineers, but I got super busy in the end and I wasn't able to finish it. Um, but yeah, this was really the story of the beginning. Damn, that's crazy, man. And I mean, you mentioned that you cut class and it's not like the best example. But dude, like realistically speaking, you probably did a much more fruitful thing by cutting the hike than versus like just going to Walrus or something. Like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I remember I would like, no, sometimes I would even go to Walrus and then go hike the... Then the go hike after? Yeah, right. Oh my God. You serious? God. Yeah, I would like <laughs> in Katipunan where you can take a grab or like uh, ride the jeep all the way to New Rizal. Yeah. And you can take a trike from there and just hike the, the Sierra Madre. You know, there's a lot of mountains there. And just watch the stars and camp 4 a.m., watch the sunrise, then go back to the class my next the next day, 7 a.m. <laughs> Damn, that, that's what you go all passion, man. Um, but thank you for sharing a, a little bit more context on this very first photo of your Instagram account. So why don't we move on to the next one? And the next photo is this one in Patagonia, Ooh, as you mentioned earlier. This is a, just a stunning shot of the like crystal blue glaciers, and you know, there's even this walkway there just to give things into perspective of how small we are in this world so why don't you share you, like your insights on what it was like taking this shot yeah i think this shot was you know seeing the glaciers was so alien to me as a filipino when i when i took that uh, took this photo because you know we've grown up in islands going to beaches or forests you know tropical forest there it was just completely kilometers and kilometers span of ice and you can hear it cracking and you can hear it, how small we are, basically how insignificant we are in the larger scheme of things of how the earth, the geography, the geology, I mean, of the earth. And it was, I think it, this is in Perito Moreno. Yeah, it's in Perito Moreno. It's right on top of the caption, uh, the photo, but I mean, <laughs> it was, yeah. Perito Moreno is like one of the last few glacial um, lakes or they call it the, like the kilometers of fresh water frozen fresh water that we have in the planet really? and it's a glacial wetland and I was there and I was really witnessing the the glaciers you know um, crack and um, melt it's it's receding it's been it's been receding and just being there it felt you were in like in a thunder cloud basically you're in the middle of a thunder cloud that even the smallest um, glacial rock that falls or thaws it's, it sounds like thunders in the lake like it because it was really really huge really really huge it's about 50 me 50 meters high wow that's insane and yeah like like you said it just puts things into perspective how insignificant we are in the grand scheme of things and how you know this helps how, you how much we, yeah sorry. yeah how much we have impact to it you know yeah not just our insignificance but like we are we are insignificant in the grand scheme of things but how we've actually added to that to the impact of it all you go so we talked about cali earlier and this is probably one of the most famous shots of cali i'd say right now like when you search tamarau or search cali the tamarau this are this is one of the first photos that pops up in google so what was it like taking this photo of such an iconic species for uh philippine wildlife conservation this was actually also the first time that i've seen oh wait no this wasn't the first time um, but yeah, the seeing the last captive bred Tamara Kali, I think it was really a, you know a, an icon of hope in conservation because we've known the Tamara as a um, proclaimed as a national land mammal, and just seeing it out uh, out there that how we were able to use science to be able to save a species from extinction, it just gives me hope. But you know. He's 20 plus years old and he and he died. But it's really a tragic story. Sometimes I can't even look at this photo anymore because <laughs> yeah. 
there was really this attachment that we had with um, Cali. Uh, right. This was in, taken in 2018 during a UNDP project for the bi uh, biodiversity camp for UNDP. And I think this was actually the last time that I've, I've saw Cali right. um, during that moment. And how he gave so much inspiration to the local communities, to the, to the rangers, to the Tamara Rangers and to so many other people out there. And even he was like holding, you know, ha has this leaf on him, like showing peace and, you know, the dove with the, the, the leaf and the, the, right, and right. the olive branch. But um, it really just, the connection that we had with Cali was really, un was really remarkable. And it was, I think it was really a special connection because it brought so much um, help and support for the Tamara Rangers. And I've never realized how, yeah, photography could really make an impact to people. Like just being able to show a photo of Cali, how being able to raise millions of pesos for for UNDP and uh, just to, you know, employ new Tamara Rangers who were cut off or affected by the pandemic. So I think right. more than just showing this iconic species, it's what we can do with it, right? Yeah, it really is what we can do with the power of photography and the power of storytelling really and i'm sure it was like really hard for you to even think about it because you actually had a personal relationship with gali like i don't know to what extent it was but you saw her in the flesh and then you saw you know w w what uh, uh, what his demeanor was like so yeah it makes it all the more tough but you know you're, you're sending a good message out there so that's great so for this next photo um, I'm actually not sure what species of bird this is and like we mentioned earlier how difficult it is to take dope wildlife photography so what was it like taking this amazing aerial shot of this falcon eagle yeah this is a Bramini kite um, mm, right. in, yeah in, and I actually took this in the goose and marsh okay um, it was really funny story when I took this photo because we were just right about to ride the pump boat so it was really wobbly that time. And I, I had like the 500 mm lens. It was so huge. Yeah. So it was so hard. And it was it was so close to us when it was flying up the river because we were supposed to uh, cross the river that time with the boat. And just, I think it's really spectacular to be able to see the real wild in the Philippines. You know, because nowadays it's even hard if you're living in Manila. You don't even get to see so much like these charismatic or huge birds out there that right. we used to have when we were young. We would see a lot of egrets or herons or you know falcons right. and yeah. raptors, and now you it's harder it's harder to reach them. Like you really have to go to really, really remote places or far flung places just to see them in the wild and their in all their glory and doing their you know natural um, behaviors. Like I think this one was I was lucky actually with the. Shot the, he just had the fish um, caught, so he was just oh, wow. he just finished hunting. That's that's an amazing shot. And to get these photos, uh, what are you doing? Are you really just like firing away, and then later in the long, you just choose like the best shot, and like you're just, you know, I, I'm pretty sure your camera goes up to like at least like 15 fps. So are you yeah. just like firing away? Yeah. Um. Some actually, I'm not really a trigger happy person. Okay. So I, I think I only had like four photos oh, wow. of the for the of this raptor when it when it flew flew by man um, that, that's crazy but, but yeah usually when you when you're shooting but more intimate um moments i guess well, it, well this wasn't an intimate moment because this was an animal right like it was yeah. just really <laughs> it wasn't like more of people or photojournalistic uh journalistic type but i guess it was really just you know lucky that it flew by when i had my camera on with me at that moment because right. sometimes we, we have to wait like when we were looking for this mindanao hornbill in the agusan marsh it took us like five days just to see one in the wild and wow. we were just sitting and camping staying in this uh, middle of the peat, peat swamp forest so there was a lot a lot of insects a lot of um 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 it was really like we were just there sitting a lot of patience that it took just to, to take a photo of the Mindanao Hornbill. And luckily it appeared like the last day when we were almost about to give up. It, a two, a couple just swung by a white one and uh, the uh, the brown one. Oh no, the black black and blue one. Yeah, yeah 
I think I've seen that photo. It's amazing how, you know, you really have to have so much patience when looking for these animals, especially because the numbers are so low and they're very elusive of humans. So, man, that, that's, that's, that's a crazy story. Um, so for this next one, it is this photo in the Cordillera region and it is of an Aitaman. I don't know if he's the chieftain, but it's, um, a, it's an amazing photo of like the yeah. rice terraces. And yeah, what, what was it like taking this photo? Yeah, he's actually a, an Igorot, not, not okay. in Aita, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, it was you know this was taken in 2019 when we were we had a this um expedition in Banawe, Banawe Rice Terraces. So this is in the Banawe UNESCO World Heritage Site, and I really wanted to show evoke that kind of emotion and connection with the land with people and how these people were living. And happened to pass by um, in his full, full cloth. Um, they were supposed to do the the mambobuklao ritual where they had to sacrifice this chicken. Um, and I guess it just came out of also that moment that how, how we are indeed inseparable with the land that we're in. Like these Banawi rice terraces have been there for centuries, built 100 years or so. And you have these caretakers the, the, basically they're the ca caretakers of the land who owns mm -hmm. this ancestral domain and it just gives all that power that they're here to protect this this is their land and this is not our lands to take right because these guys are the real guardians of the land and uh, you know it, it's great that you get to showcase them on your platform so for this next photo and this photo is probably one of the more striking photos in your feed and it was amazing that you were able to take this drone shot but what was it like taking this photo and what's the story behind this photo? Yeah, so this photo is actually taken during a Nat Geo project in the Agusan marshlands. And this was specifically taken in the Talakogon peatlands in the northern northwest part of the Agusan marshlands. I think um, I really wanted to show the juxtaposition of how a recently burnt peat swamp forest because um, the they're, they're really two sides of a coin of where we're heading in the future. And this happened during the one of the long prolonged droughts in Mindanao. And it really dried the, the peatlands and the swamps, or the lakes of the Agusan Marsh, and how it's all slipping away slowly and slowly, but nobody has been documenting them. Nobody has been showing it in their local platforms and news. I remember one time when I posted one of these photos, especially with the fires, the raging fires in it, um, someone from the Palma plantations threatened me and they were saying like, um, stop spreading fake news. Where did, where, where did you take this photo? And like, <laughs> what the they fuck? were asking and, and it, re it reached the DNR, it reached the governor. The photos went viral and it was kind of scary at the moment. I had to really keep low during a time, a certain period of time. Because I was being trawled by these kids of the owners of the largest, one of the largest palma plantations in Sultan Kudarat. And, and I really felt, you know, um, kind of afraid because they have the power, they have the money. That if I do a site visit or I go out in the field there again, I could get killed. Because, yeah. you know, the Philippines is the, like, the, one of the deadliest countries for environmental defenders. Of course, and yeah. And it's not just my life that's at risk. It's the, the people that have been working in there. Like, who helped you go to this place? Who who helped you take these photos? Or like, who was with you when you were doing this project? It, and it affects the, the, the DNR or the environmental enforcers there because they don't know what could happen to them. But Man. it needs to be shown to the world that these this is happening right in our backyard, that these fires are happening right in our backyard. And... We have to tell more stories of these because this is the re the reality that we're facing right now. That the climate crisis is here, and and you know there's still hope. I wanted to show that you know there's two sides that we can go to: the one on the left or the one on the right. And it depends on the actions that we do with the government, with people, with local communities in the Agusan Marsh in order to actually rehabilitate and protect the area. Man, that's really powerful stuff, man. And it's great that you're uh, advocating to present this even despite the dangers that go along with, especially with the anti-terrorism bill that's like about to be passed. And 
it's like it's a, yeah. it's a huge risk but you know it's it, honestly if if you don't do it then who will and you know by setting this example for people you you may spark a light in them to kind of follow those footsteps and you know change the future generation because there still is a chance and as you mentioned there are always two sides of the coin so it's great that you're taking this initiative all right so for the very last photo <laughs> This is a, rec a recent photo, and it's of an Olive Ridley. Am I correct, or is that a leather? Yeah, bag? that's a baby Olive Ridley. Olive Ridley. So cute, so tiny, yeah, like five dude, peso coin. And... They're the cutest thing in the world. I swear. Well, yeah, what was it like taking this photo? Like, was this during sunset or sunrise? And yeah, put, put, this put was some during, more context. Yeah, this was during sunset. Uh, we were working with Project Korma here when we took that photo because there's this Pawikan Rehabilitation Center. Um, it's called Project Kurma in Illinorte. It's actually, you know, we're neighbors basically. It's just a street a block away from my, from where I'm staying right now in La Union. But this was taken in at sunset, and I don't know. They're just the most adorable thing. Like when you see them crack open uh, from the nest or from the shell, they and they just like start squirming around the 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 sand, mm -hmm. and they're just they have so much energy in life that they just yeah. want to, you know, squirm all the way to the ocean and they just follow the light, which is so amazing. Right. You know, yeah. like how these creatures is just literally born out of existence in their existence at this very moment. And they're just here to follow the light to the ocean or depends on the time, like the moon or the sunset. So it was really quite a magical experience. It was my first time to see like, turtles really being coming out from eggs and like coming out from the nest and it's literally like birth right like a birth to a yeah. child <laughs> so it was kind of that experience that kind of moment that that happened and they're just really really cute and <laughs> Dude, yeah they're yeah. so they're adorable like, and there's it's so cute because they're like you said they're so energetic but then they're so clumsy when they get out i mean it's their first yeah. seconds of life so it's like they're falling over each other and some yeah. are stuck upside down so you gotta like <laughs> give them a little flip i don't trust anyone who doesn't like baby turtles you know yeah. like, you, don't need, you don't need that yeah. type of person in your life yeah <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, man, thank you so much for sharing some of your insights on some of these photos. And, you know, when you look at your feed, it's always like the 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 highs of your trip, like the glamorized, the, the best parts of your journey. But, you know, I'm sure there's like a lot of untold truth that goes on behind the scenes of getting these spectacular shots. So like, what is like one of common like untold truth that goes along with taking you know, landscape photography or, or wildlife photography? Yeah, I think, you know, there's a lot of suffering and sacrifice that comes with photography in general and even landscape and wildlife photography. Um, there are most days like what I would spend alone at night camping or freezing in the cold at negative 20 degrees Celsius. But you just, and like people need to realize how you have to be there in that moment to experience it. like and All part there's of it. always yeah these uncertainties in wildlife and travel photography sometimes you get the shot sometimes you don't but you have to keep trying and trying again and you know i think one of also the misconceptions is that because i i honestly get a lot of messages like wow you're you're living the life and all these things right like you're traveling of course it's, it's really nice to travel right. but there's really just a lot and a lot of sacrifice that you have to deal with like you wouldn't have time to date you wouldn't have yeah. time to <laughs> go out True. with your friends and drink all the time. You would, um, and since most of our work is kind of um, international now, it's like you have to sacrifice your time zones. That when I was in uh, just a few weeks when we were doing like these publications with Nat Geo, um, it was like a whole week. I was sleeping barely one hour to two hours a day, and because wow. um, we wanted to surf in the morning, but my my work starts at around like 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. There, there's no really respect for time zones in the photography world. If you want to get things done, you want to get things published, you have to keep grinding and grinding. And and yeah, it's it's really, you know, it's a really tough life. It's a life that I chose to live, right? And I'm willing to pay for these sacrifices for the passion, for my passion. And, you know, aside from just the beautiful photo that comes with it, there's, I say that's 10% 
of my work of my work like 10 is just photography but 90 of it is research um research writing calling um crying <laughs> and all, these, <laughs> all these things you know like it's just 10 of your time that you're on the field but you have to edit you have to sit on your computer you have to research you have to work with editors you have to make sure everything is fact checked you have to all do all these things like just to and you have to gain more inspiration from it and i guess that's really one of the untold truths about travel photography or wildlife photography that there is indeed a lot of suffering and sacrifice and as long as you're willing to choose that then it will pay off I'm sure, man. And no matter what your craft is, naman, there are always going to be your own struggles that you're going to have to go through. There's mm-hmm. like always going to be adversity in one way or the other. And I guess like you, like saying, like going back to your mountain analogy, it's like you just have to power through and don't descend when you're not yet at the top. So that's some great tips. And speaking of tips, I guess what would be an advice for some people who are just starting out or who even want to start out? Because let's say, You're a Manila kid, um, like myself, always enthralled with mm-hmm. wildlife and um, nature, and you want to take more photos of wildlife and nature. But what would be an advice, maybe let's say to yourself, if like maybe 2013 when you first hiked up that mountain, what would you tell yourself? I think really start start in your own backyard if you really want to take up, you know, wildlife and nature photography. Um, there's a lot of things that we we haven't been seeing. And if you just go out in the park or go out in your local forest, if you have a local forest <laughs> you, or a local park or even coral reefs, we're, we're so blessed in the Philippines to have, you know, natural landscapes. You even go to Manila Bay, you can see a beautiful sunset. And right. you just have to take that initiative to go out there and explore. Because, And it, I know sometimes it could be frustrating. You, you don't have the allowance to, to take a Jeep or you take to take the a car to go to a different um, mountain area but as long as you, again it's if you're willing to sacrifice these small things just to to push your craft or to to learn more about and immerse yourself in nature it it really really pulls through i'm sure man and that's some great advice for no matter whether they want to get into wildlife photography or not just in life in general and you know we talked a lot about your work of like what you did, how you did it. But my last question revolves more about you as a person. So my question is, what's one word that would describe you? Hmm. Uh, I guess I'm going to have this tattooed actually in my arm today. Okay. <laughs> Or tomorrow. Oh, wow. in oh. yeah. right. But it, it, Good timing. <laughs> um, it, I think the word, I mean, it comes from this word called chaos. I, it's, I think I would say my life or the word best word that would describe me as chaotic and i see a lot of sense in it in chaos like it really goes really deep but like 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 <laughs> chaos right. isn't just something like dirty or unorganized or not or out of order like honestly in the world of like science or physics or like chaos is something that can be predicted or something an uncertainty that can be measured right entropy Yeah, like entropy. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, entropy, the the thermodynamics of things and chaos, the the science of, or the the science of chaos, basically, and it really resonated and really works. You know, like maybe you know the world isn't just a balance, but it is indeed like a, cha- a chaotic world, and it's something that I'm trying to embody in how I perceive life. That things are really chaotic, but it is a certain extent can be measured and controlled and it's something like taking control of you know the unorderness or the, the 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 loss of balance in it right we're not here to bring balance to the world like the avatar or something right. like that <laughs> yeah. like that's very a messianic complex kind of ideal it's really you know chaos and how you can control and measure this, these uncertainties in our life Uh, of your personality of your identity of your of your passions and your career that really you know i guess would best describe myself or what i'm trying to be that's beautiful man yeah just trying to find your own peace in this world of chaos and yeah. uh, 
it's 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 uh, it's a good thing to get tattooed on yourself yeah. like, to remind yourself <laughs> right? like you know yeah. that the world will always be chaotic but you know you have to find your sense of serenity some in one way or another and chaos is not necessarily always a bad thing yeah exactly right so um i guess that about does it for this pod so i want to wrap up the pod by saying thank you again so much for being on the show honestly had so much fun talking with you and learning about wildlife photography just landscape photography travel all of these things but before i go and before we go now would be a perfect time for you to plug in where the people can find you or the work that you do yeah, you can follow me at my photography account at Gab Mejia. So it's G-A-B-M-E-J-I-A. Or you can, you know, hit me up in Instagram or my portfolio website, which is www.gabmejia.com. That's great, man. So um, for those of you guys that want to learn more about Gab, he has his own website and you can find him on Instagram pretty easily. And I'm pretty sure if you if you have any questions um, regarding wildlife photography or landscape photography, he'd be more than happy to share his insights on that. So I guess that about does it for this pod. I want to thank you all listeners for tuning in to another episode of the Rockus Modern Life podcast. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that share with hashtag RML podcast and hit that follow on Spotify, Facebook and Instagram so that you never miss an episode. And as always, I'll see you all in the next one. Deuces.